So I will say just some few words uh, on Stephen uh, uh, P. Turner. Uh, you might know that he's from Tampa in Florida, uh, and uh, that he was announcing a surprising title, Durkheim as an error theorist. <laughs> So everybody was fantasizing about this. What will he really tell us? The title is telling us, at least, that there must stand a philosopher behind. And this is true, uh, and not an error, I suppose, dealing with conjectures and uh, refutations in search of truth, as I could learn in a wonderful discussion uh, yesterday uh, evening. So social scientists know uh, your work. Uh, not the f uh, not uh, perhaps not so much the philosophical work, but your book uh, that is a very deep uh, reading of uh, Weber, uh, for example, the lawyer as social thinker, and this has been uh, uh, very important, uh, I think. And you will see uh, when looking into the uh, introduction of the historical and critical edition on his writings on the law uh, that there might be some similarities in our reading and that was produced in a more parallel way than <laughs> dependent on one another. So this is a topic at least very much related to the center's interest in Max Weber. But the other works, I just go back only to the, the, uh, the year 2010. But you must know how wide the interests and the expertise is, to begin with the politics of expertise. <laughs> Uh, of 2014, um, then uh, uh, understanding something I, I find wonderful, the tacit. This is very much uh, a, also a juristic problem. Uh, the silence, to interpret the silence, or the normative meaning of the silence. When does it, the non-existence turns into something that has a normative uh, power? A very difficult question in, in, civil, in civil law. Uh, then about uh, American sociology, from pre-disciplinary to post-normal. Uh, I must confess that I haven't read the book and I have to do it. But uh, perhaps for our context now, the most important might be explaining the normative. And I suppose that your talk might be in the vein or in the line of this, uh, these reflections. Uh, and I really uh, am uh, now really eager to understand what the error theorist okay. Emil Durkheim is. I have some ideas about that. Perhaps I will see whether I got it right or wrong. So okay, please, the floor is yours. Great. Very welcome at our set. Okay, so uh, I'm going to look at, at uh, Durkheim in a quite different context uh, because the uh, an important way of understanding many of the little remarks that he makes is to see him in the general context of the uh, collapse or dissolution, as Gadamer says, of neo-Kantianism. So he's, he's uh, trained as a neo-Kantian philosopher. At the end of his life, he is a member of uh, the uh, French uh, Philosophical Academy, and he's writing about uh, morality in a way that actually connects back up to very traditional uh, Kantian and neo-Kantian uh, questions and he wants to go beyond sociology to say something uh, actually normative. So how did he uh, do this and so forth. And so uh, in fact he's a kind of moral objectivist and so the question is how does he get there and how does he reconcile this with his uh, uh, sociology. Um, so I want to just go through this very complicated background and uh, try to uh, make sense of it. <clears throat> so it really is, is uh, uh, crucial to understand what the original neo-Kantian uh, idea was and uh, uh, probably the most important text here is uh, from Herman Cohen who takes Kant and, and turns him upside down and basically argues that, uh, to th that in a very bizarre circular way that the success of mathematical physics establishes the validity of the category. So it's the fact that you have an organized body of knowledge that establishes the 
the uh, uh, validity of the, uh, the, of the categories or fundamental presuppositions. So validity is a really important uh, uh, concept here. And this works really well for mathematical physics until it, it hits its titanic iceberg with uh, uh, Einstein and the whole of uh, neo-Kantian physical uh, theory um, collapses, uh, it really sinks and, and everyone drowns. Uh, so, uh, so, but at the time, this was pretty straightforward. There was one mathematical physics, it was organized in one way, it made perfect sense to say it was a logical structure, uh, there was, it wasn't really about psychology, so you could use this you know, Kantian distinction between logic and psychology. And the idea was that the, the science itself is logically organized, the organization could be discovered, uh, and these organizing ideas would be validated because they're the logical conditions of the, the science. So this is a great model, and it then becomes used for lots of other things, and then things get a little complicated. So this was a great template. You could apply it to uh, anything, and anything at least that was an organized body of knowledge. So uh, naturally, the law was next up. So you've got one, and Cohen himself does this. Uh, so he, he says, okay, uh, w what about ethics? And he says, well, uh, we already have the law. That sort of tells us what the, the organized body of, uh, of ethical ideas is. And that presupposes the concept of justice. So uh, we, we've got an organized uh, uh, Wissenschaft here that uh, we can apply this uh, template to. Now that works great, except that everybody that went to the law came up with a different idea of what, how it was organized and what the fundamental uh, presuppositions were. So uh, even though the key idea of neo-Kantianism is that you get this unique necessary set of preconditions, presuppositions, in fact, what you got out of neo-Kantianism was this incredible diversity of answers which undermined the whole project. And it was very slow to dawn on people that this just wasn't going to work. But gradually they did, and certainly by Durkheim's time, he is exquisitely attuned to these problems, and I'll uh, try to explain how he uh, responds to them. Um, okay, so. The basic issues here that come up with uh, neo-Kantianism, the one that really kills it in the German context is this problem of uh, rigidity. So the idea was that, well, life is fluid, flowing, and so on and so forth. Concepts are rigid. How can we possibly uh, capture what's important in life if uh, our concepts are rigid. So this leads to Leibniz's philosophy and then to existentialism, to Heidegger, to the whole, uh, 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 depends on how you think of it, the good or bad uh, conclusion to this. Um, but there's a, a more basic problem that I'll try to give examples of with uh, circularity and uh, regresses. Um, so if you, the, the basic neo-Kantian strategy I'll try to show is, is actually a kind of funny kind of circularity. Uh, but the, the basic strategy for uh, talking about conceptual order involves uh, Cohen's version of the transcendental induction, which leads you to look for ever more uh, basic presuppositions, only it's a problem of ending this series. So that's the regress problem. Um, then there's a problem with uh, universality and local conceptual orders. So, uh, and this, this is, in, in somebody like Kassir you see this problem. So he's got, he concludes that, well, yes, there is this symbolic order, it's universal, but we only selectively appropriate it from one uh, community to another. Um, but what's important for them is they really wanted universality, they didn't want to be relativists, so they didn't want to say, and this is extremely relevant to Durkheim, because he also didn't want to say this, that uh, say what we can call normativity is restricted to a local uh, community or a local conceptual order. That, that for them can't be right, but they had a lot of trouble explaining 
how to get out of that problem. Um, and then there's a problem about motivation. And this is, is very important for uh, Durkheim. Uh, and it's a, uh, he refers back to uh, Kant himself. And it's really uh, a, a problem in, in Kant's ethics. So uh, if you say something like, uh, uh, we have to abide by the categorical imperative, then you have to say, well, why do we have to abide by it? Who cares? Uh, and so many of uh, Kant's critics in the 19th century just said this is you know, completely implausible. What you need is an ethical account that's actually uh, motivating. Um, and, and this is uh, something when, when we go from mathematical physics to um, normative pr domains like law, then this problem arises and it doesn't seem like the solution that's going to work for mathematical physics about presuppositions is going to work for something that actually has to motivate uh, people. Okay, so circularity is really built into the uh, approach and so Kant himself says uh, we only have complete, we have complete insight only into that which we can make ourselves and according to our own concepts. So he understands, he's a kind of constructivist about uh, the world. He doesn't, you can't uh, know the world in itself and so on and so forth. Yet, when we do this Faktum der Wissenschaft business, we pretend that uh, that's not happening and we we treat that as not a human product, but as something that's like an autonomous logical order that we can investigate and get the sort of logical uh, structure of. So it's a kind of uh, a magic trick to, uh, on the one hand, make math mathematical physics as a human product and then analyze it as though it's not a human uh, product. Um, so the... Uh, um, yeah, so Cohen's very good on this. It's that uh, um, the uh, pr uh, synthetic a priori principles are already there, contained in uh, experience, and the task of philosophy is to articulate these principles. So uh, experience is, is treated as a given uh, and uh, not something that we uh, uh, make. Okay. Now, as this project developed, it went in two directions, uh, which were always uh, interdependent, but uh, uh, the emphasis is, is quite uh, different. One is, uh, looks at just what the conceptual order is. So it looks for, for conceptual order. Uh, the other one is, is more strictly uh, concerned with transcendental arguments. Um, and so, and I, I'll go on to give some examples of this. So in mathematical physics, this isn't a problem. It's, you get the same thing. You want to get the, the logical preconditions. Uh, when you get to these other domains, you really get quite uh, different results. And um, uh, Durkheim himself uh, discusses exactly this. So his idea is there's an objective rationality, imminent reality, rationality given in the things themselves which the inquirer discovers, brings out, but does not create. This is one of many comments that show you the extent to which Durkheim is, is completely within the, the universe of uh, uh, neo-Kantian analysis. Uh, and how he's taking sides in these issues. So he's, he's looking at the, this imminent conceptual order. Um, okay, so the circularity problem, uh, th then, but any of these involves this kind of circularity problem. So we, we say we're looking at the fact, uh, but the fact has to be described in a certain way. And so we can't really uh, say, oh, we're, we're arbitrarily choosing this description of this, and then we're going to explain our arbitrarily chosen description. Or, uh, that, that doesn't persuade anybody. We have to present it as a real <laughs> autonomous fact in order to claim that this is the real thing. So this is the real meaning of the law, uh, for example. And in the law in particular, uh, this is uh, a problem. So you have, it looks like the perfect thing to do this analysis on, 
Uh, it's a relatively stable object. It's a well-organized uh, domain of uh, knowledge, and it seems that all you really need is a theory to tell us uh, what falls into the category of law and what is the conceptual organization. But uh, as you define the law differently, you get potentially different conceptual organizations of this uh, defined uh, domain. So I just want to make some comparisons to, to philosophy of law uh, generally. And uh, um, so given this problem, how do you get out of it? Well, the famous example is uh, uh, Kelsen. And uh, Kelsen's answer is that he's going to give a theory of positive law, meaning he's going to look at everything that is taken to be law, and that's going to be the fact. He's not going to define the concept of law. He's going to just empirically look at what actual uh, law is. Um, so uh, so this, this is a way of avoiding circularity. You get something that really is separate. It's not your own definition. It's somebody else's. Uh, uh, definition of what the law is. Um, but the price of this for Kelsen is that he is committed to this transcendental deduction uh, approach rather than the sort of this rational, this conceptual organization approach. And he's asking the question of, okay, what's the condition? And he's always asking you about validity. What's the condition about of the validity of a law? And the famous phrase is, law is made according to law. So that's a nice regress. You, to understand whether something's a law, you just keep going back to the law that authorizes it, except, of course, th this would be uh, uh, infinite. So uh, his argument is that, well, uh, you can't have a regress, so there must be something that validates law by authorizing law giving, and this is his uh, uh, famous concept of the Grün norm. Um, but he's unable to really make much sense of uh, uh, the Grün norm uh, because it doesn't really stop uh, the regress. It just says that something stops the regress. Uh, so there's an, aren't really, it's ambiguous as to whether they're actually uh, Grün norms. So some people think, oh, well, it's the Grün norm of a particular uh, legal uh, order. Uh, but that's certainly not his view, and so he, he in fact, tries to ground it all in, in uh, international law, which is uh, uh, very peculiar because the international law he cites comes after the laws that he's explaining, but he says, well, that's not a problem. <laughs> it's a matter of logic, not uh, uh, history. But in any case, uh, the, the, for us, the interesting thing is there's a kind of ambiguity about the Grün norm. Is it a fact fact or is it a normative fact? And it has to really be both in order to stop the regress. If it's just a normative fact, you can keep asking, well, what authorized that normative fact? You want to cut that off, and, and cutting that off is uh, uh, also a problem for uh, Durkheim. <clears throat> okay, so Durkheim doesn't go that way, obviously. Uh, he follows the other strategy, and he wants to discover the rational order that's there in the object of analysis. And he recognizes that uh, the other analyses give rise to circularity because, the, and he repeatedly, I mean, this is something he says over and over again. He criticizes people for starting with the idea of something and analyzing that, and that is the neo-Kantian problem. Uh, they start with the idea of the law or the idea of physics and then uh, find the order and rather than the actual thing. Um, okay, so he's sensitive to this circularity problem uh, and he's got a, uh, he's also sensitive to the regress problem. So his, uh, the way he stops the regress is also by identifying law with uh, an empirical fact. Um, but he does it in a, a different way in relation to normativity. So the, rather than finding the, making the empirical fact a, a norm uh, on the basis, uh, that's on the basis of law itself, um, he argues that, well, it's a kind of derivative norm that's based on the sacred profane uh, distinction. Uh, so that, every, in fact, everything uh, 
and uh, all of the fundamental categories of thought are of religious origin and so forth. So he doesn't need to explain the normative character or the, the, the sort of element of normativity in all of these domains. It's already built in by the fact that it's differentiated out of an already fundamentally normative uh, uh, world view. Okay, so, um, so re religion or, or the sacred pro profane distinction becomes the ultimate uh, regress stopper. And uh, he also yeah. makes the point, this also has to be a normative as well as a factual kind of uh, fact. And he stresses that uh, it's not just a system of ideas, it's a body of uh, ritual practice as well. And he gives many examples in elementary forms of objects that have this dual character of being sacred and uh, physical. So, and this is actually turns out to be a quite common strategy for dealing with this uh, uh, problem. But then you have to ask how plausible is this uh, uh, solution? Um, so the problem is to get, how do you get religious ideas in the first place? And here's where things get uh, muddy. Uh, they are <laughs> sui generis. <laughs> he doesn't have an explanation of it. Uh, they just come out of uh, religious experience and uh, we can't really uh, say where religious experience comes from. It's just uh, a fact that it is. And this is also very Kantian because this use of uh, experience is uh, meant to be uh, Kantian. So we've got these sensations uh, and they're given external symbolic form which enables them to become collective and uh, again this is a bit mysterious but uh, and, and I think some of this owes something as with many people to uh, William James and the uh, uh, mm -hmm. idea of religious experience. That there is some distinctive thing that's a religious experience and for Durkheim then these become uh, uh, collective ideas and uh, they get symbolized in religious performances and so forth. Okay, so, um, so we get these symbolic representations of sensations and then we need to figure out how does this turn into this rationally organized uh, world and also um, what's the force of uh, of this? So he's got uh, tries to answer this motivation uh, problem as well, and so that sort of the the methodological individualist answer to this is oh well people want salvation they believe in these particular things they're therefore motivated to act in a particular way, and uh, Durkheim says no no this can't uh, can't work. Uh, because of this exteriority or externality uh, problem, uh, we experience it as real. It's back to this, uh, this the nature of uh, our experience. And uh, um, so the, the motive uh, has to be, um, has to come from outside. It, the, uh, um, or it has to uh, be created within us somehow or other. Um, so his, his successor and uh, uh, explicator, uh, Boulier, um, who really um, is an underrated uh, uh, source of information about this, um, gives a much more elaborated uh, account, or at least attempts a more elaborated account. And the story of motivation then becomes, uh, again, one of these sui generis uh, uh, phenomena people associate together. This force is uh, uh, created. This is the original so force uh, in the world of values, and uh, it exercises pressure and attraction and so on and so forth. It's more than the sum of the parts, and blah blah blah. This is sort of the basic uh, Durkheimian uh, picture. Um, okay, so he, that's how he solves the problem of uh, of motivation. Um, now, uh, he also uh, wants to provide a, he, he apparently rejects the neo-Kantian project uh, um, in the philosophy of law 
and he says that, yeah, this is really not about law, it's about the idea of law. What we really need to do is consider the law as a set of things, um, of given realities, the laws of which must be sought according to the methods of the natural sciences. And he says that there's a method he has in mind is uh, Mill's method of concomitant variation. But uh, um, he, at the same time, and this is this dual character of this original thing, is that it's a system of concepts linked logically among themselves and uh, 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 so, so this is the, the neo-Kantian thing, is a system of concepts linked logically to themselves and subordinated to a master concept which in large part contains them. That's the, the neo-Kantian solution. So he says he's not doing that, um, but uh, in fact he uh, is. So he says that, that I'm going to just treat these as things and, and use Mill's methods on them. But then as soon as he starts qualifying this, he says, gee, this is actually, uh, uh, a, a, there's an interesting idea contained to this, in this, and it turns out the interesting idea has to do with the conceptual dependences and development of this thought. So he is, is also trying to uh, look at the, the rational and conceptual order of these things. And as soon as you start talking about presupposed here, we're back in the, the uh, neo-Kantian universe, uh, universe of um, um, conceptual order. So this mixing of the causal and the logical is really central to his conception of how collective ideation uh, works. And when, you, when we start looking at what the laws are, uh, it turns out they're more or less laws of logic or laws of for what he calls formal psychology that we don't really understand yet, but we, we can uh, uh, begin to investigate. Um, okay, so, uh, so we've got, now it turns out this, this differentiates in a sort of interesting way. Um, we've got th laws of thought. They're the, the laws of uh, logical and philosophical, logical or conceptual analysis that he's bracketing. There's laws of individual psychology. There are a separate set of laws which is irreducible to that and maybe different of uh, collective thought. And each of these have a kind of uh, rationality. They're organizing principles of ideas or representations. Um, and uh, so there's raw experience uh, which is, it, for Kantians, it's experience of rep representations. And so we really have four different or orders which uh, don't correspond fully and can't be reducible uh, to the others. Okay, so what does he think uh, is, is going on here? Uh, he tries to defend the idea of uh, concepts. So remember, <coughs> way back a few minutes ago, I was talking about this rigidity problem, rigidity of concepts versus life. So he is also talking about this kind of uh, problem. And uh, he grants the, the view that sensual representations are a perpetual flux. So that can't really explain what he wants to explain. Uh, concepts, he says, are outside of time and change. This is a very Neo-Kantian way of thinking of it. And uh, so, but his solution is to say, ah, this is in a different portion of the mind, which is serener and calmer. Well, of course, it's the collective portion of the mind. And so the concept, he assimilates concepts to collective uh, representations and uh, then uh, explains concepts in terms of their uh, um, collective uh, origin. Bears the mark of no particular mind elaborated by a unique intelligence where all minds meet one another and after a fashion come to nourish themselves. So this unique intelligence turns out to be, uh, have a lot of, of interesting uh, powers. And uh, if we go back to this notion of experiences, it turns out that um, societies themselves uh, have experiences that are distinct from uh, the uh, individuals themselves. So this is a really strange, strange concept. Um, but 
uh, it enables him to, to talk about the rationality and distinctiveness of this uh, social level. Okay, so summary. Am I running out of time here yet? Not yet. Um, so he, he decircularizes by appealing to social facts that are independent of his theory. He solves the regress problem with this sort of dual normative and factual uh, basis in uh, religion and specifically in the dualism of sacred and profane, which reappears in the law. So this is, uh, uh, it reappears all over the place. And in the case of the law, it's, it's that the law has an ideal, the reality is that people violate the law. Uh, so it's a kind of analog to the concept versus uh, uh, experience relation and the, uh, also the sacred and uh, uh, profane relation. Um, and so for him, the interesting problem is how do you get concepts uh, in the first place? How, then how are we different from animals? Well, we have concepts, and these have to come from this uh, uh, collective process. Um, yeah, he also answer, gives an answer to this question of uh, the motivating force of ideas, which was a, a, a big problem uh, for his uh, legal contemporaries like Fouillet. Um, and uh, this is, again, he solves it in terms of this uh, um, the conceptual organization of the, the realm of collective ideation. Um, okay, so with all this, we're still more or less, though, in the domain of, of sociology. You don't get any uh, moral advice out of uh, learning these facts. You get a description of the functioning of the uh, collective world and uh, uh, explanation of lots of things, but we're not really um, uh, normative yet. So we're, we're still in the is. And the question is, can we get to the ought uh, from that? And um, can we get an answer to Vindelbaum's question of, uh, if, if philosophy is the science of the necessary and universally valid determinations of values, uh, or value itself, um, how do you get from these facts about collective representation to actual conclusions about impersonal moral truths? Um, okay, so he wants to get there. He wants to give, uh, uh, he, he th wants to say that there is a kind of, uh, of uh, moral advice that we can give um, that's different from merely uh, description and um, this is the uh, argument that he ultimately gives. He first says, e within each of us, there's a dualism of the personal and impersonal, okay? Uh, and so the fact that there's something impersonal in us is because there's something social in all of us. Social life embraces at once both representations and practices, so this extends to ideas as well as to act. So the, the realm of ideas is, uh, uh, not so much reduced to, but, but uh, fit into the realm of representation and practices, which is the social uh, realm. So what's interesting here is you got two kinds of representations, the subjective ones uh, and, or the individual ones. And his argument is that uh, individual representations can err because they contain subjective elements. So subjective is the, is the negative uh, word here. And then the project of uh, attaining moral truth turns into one of ridding us of these uh, subjective elements. So he talks about these being progressively rooted out. Uh, and uh, so here's the error theory. Uh, we start out with all of these highly diverse, different cultures with their own, uh, as well as our own subjective ideas, and we gradually uh, uh, get rid of these subjective ideas and uh, um, open the way to this stable, impersonal, and organized uh, uh, thought, which is social. So how do we get, get there? This sounds like a sort of mental hygiene operation out of uh, Comte. And, uh, uh, but that's actually not his uh, answer to this. Um, so, uh, but you can see now he's already trying to escape from uh, relativism, that uh, by, by 
putting the relative parts into the category of subjective, he can say, yeah, you can get rid of these uh, uh, subjective elements. Okay, so what's the magic solution to all of this? Um, and this is much clearer in Goulier, but it's, it's already there in, in Durkheim. Uh, communities amalgamate, and every time they amalgamate, the subjective elements start getting knocked out. They're rooted out by our cosmopolitanism uh, and so forth. And this actually runs through moral education and, and other uh, texts of uh, Durkheim's as well. Uh, so we start approaching um, the more the most common uh, collective representations. We start eliminating this uh, subjective element, and uh, we'll, we may never get there. Uh, it's an ideal limit to which we're constantly approaching. We'll never probably never succeed in reaching. But that's the direction. So there's an objective direction to uh, morality. And um, uh, so this actually um, solves the problem, uh, at least the relativism problem. And it gets you the, the answer to the question is, what is the most, uh, the, the ultimate and necessary uh, conclusion to this kind of moral discussion? Uh, and that's the holy grail. The, the true impersonal moral representations which arise from a community and are unique and necessary because of the characteristics of the community, but now it's the cosmopolitan community, the community which can't be surpassed because it's the complete uh, human community. Um, so uh, if, if we could achieve this, we would have something like the final morality. Now that might, in fact, also uh, change, but in fact, we'll never get there. So it's an ideal uh, limit. But it's an ideal limit that gets us moral objectivity. So we, we know at least what uh, moral objectivity would look like. It's the ridding of everything of uh, subjective elements. So that's... Uh, <laughs>